discussing the various clauses which are there in this particular convention. So paragraph one of article five defines a fixed place of business resulting in a permanent establishment. So if a non-resident has a fixed place of business in the source state, then in that case, would that result into a PE or not is something which is discussed in para one. Para two basically is an extension of paragraph one and it specifies as to which all places would specifically be covered under a fixed place PE within the meaning of paragraph one. Paragraph three also sometimes refers to as building or construction or installation PE arises where a non-resident is working on a building project or a construction project or an installation project in the source state. Paragraph four provides certain exclusion. So paragraph two provides inclusion, what is included in the definition of fixed place PE under paragraph one. Paragraph four, on the other hand, provides exclusions. And when I say exclusions, basically, these are activities which are more of a preparatory or auxiliary in character insofar as a non-resident is concerned. And therefore, these are considered to be so remote or so less linked to the main activity of generating profits that they do not result in a permanent establishment. Now, even if a place constitutes a fixed place of business, if it is eligible for the exemption under paragraph four, then in that case, it will not result into a PE. Paragraph five is basically applicable where a foreign company has an agent in the source state and this agent constitutes a dependent agent. The word dependent itself signifies that this person is actually dependent on the foreign company. Now, it may be a related party. It may be an independent party. The agent need not necessarily be a associated enterprise or a related enterprise of the foreign company. Independent agent. Now, an independent agent is a person who is acting in the source state on behalf of non-resident, but he is independent insofar as his operations are concerned. So he is engaged in a particular business and the activities he do are included in the normal course of business of such an individual. Paragraph seven basically covers a situation where there is a holding and a subsidiary relationship between two companies. And this provides that just because a company is a subsidiary of a foreign enterprise does not mean that it will become a permanent establishment of the non-resident. Unless and until it either is a fixed place of business through which the non-resident business is carried out, it is included in the specific inclusions or it's a case of a dependent agent or a building or a construction project, just because there is an ownership linkage between the non-resident and the local enterprise would not mean that this enterprise becomes a permanent establishment of the non-resident. And paragraph eight deals with the concept of closely related enterprise. So some of the important aspects as to why PE is important which we discussed a briefly a short by Lagoa, that it decides the right of the source state to tax business profits, which are attributable to a PE. Now, these concepts we are going to discuss in a later part of this presentation, but basically that's one, the foremost important thing of a PE. Independent personal services. Now, in the earlier model tax treaties, which were there, there was a concept of independent personal services, wherein the concept which was considered was of a fixed base. So if there is an individual who was providing certain personal services to someone in the source state, then in that case, there was a separate article which covered the exit taxability of those amounts. 
However, this article has since been deleted from the OECD model convention and the taxability of this individual, which may be deriving income from professional services or other activities of an independent character, is now again taxable under Article 7 read with Article 5. VAT registration. Now, this is also becoming an important point uh, given the way the business is operating right now. So think of a non-resident who basically sells, let's say, certain electronic goods or electronic media-based goods to a source state. This non-resident, let's say, is liable to register under VAT where the revenue exceeds $100,000 in the source state. In such a case, the moment this revenue exceeds this limit, the non-resident has to obtain a VAT registration, but this non-resident is operating completely out of the source state. The question that comes up is, will this non-resident have a permanent establishment in the source state? And the answer to that is no. Just because you have a VAT registration and you are paying indirect taxes in a particular state, you will not have a PE by virtue of such registration. Insofar as a PE is concerned, that will come into existence only when the conditions of other paragraphs or Article 5 are met. Now, before we get into the specific provisions of Article 5, it is also important to understand some of the key provisions of Article 7. So, Article 7 basically deals with business profits and what it provides is that the business profit of a foreign company cannot be taxed in the source state unless and until this foreign company has a permanent establishment in the source state. Now, business profit can again be of two types. One, for which there are specific provisions in a tax treaty. So for business profits, for which there's a specific provision in the tax treaty, those clauses will apply. Think of a person who's providing consulting services to a company in the source state. These services under most of the treaty will get covered as fee for technical services for which article 12 applies. In such a case, even though these consulting services might be business profit, of the non-resident, they will not be covered under Article 7 read with Article 5, but they will be covered under Article 12. However, in many cases, Article 12 may itself have a clause which says that if this non-resident has a PE in the source state and this service is effectively connected to the PE, then it is not Article 12, but Article 7 read with Article 5 that will apply. Then in that case, we need to consider that particular clause. But generally, these clauses are applicable only when such profits are effectively connected to the PE. So from a business profit perspective, like I mentioned, the taxability of business profit, you need to see, the first question you should ask is, are the business profits dealt with in other article? In our example, it was covered in article 12. If they are covered in other article, then the provision of those articles are the one which will apply and not article seven read with article five. However, if these profits are not dealt specifically in any other article, in that case, the second question is, does the non-resident has a permanent establishment in the source state? If there is no PE, then these profits are not liable to tax. However, if there is a PE, the next question is, are these profits effectively connected or attributable to the PE? If they are again not effectively connected, they are not taxable. But if they are effectively connected, then they are taxable as per Article 7. In other words, to bring an item of income taxable under Article 7, one, they should not be dealt with in any other article. Of course, the exception I spoke about. Second is, there should be a PE. Third is, the profit should be effectively connected or attributable to the PE. If all these conditions are not satisfied, the taxation under Article 7 will not be triggered. 
Now, this is again an important point, which is that Article 7 by itself does not provide the tax rates at which the profits have to be taxed. It just provides how you have to calculate the taxable income. Now, when we look at the scheme of Article 7, Article 7 again has four clauses, unlike PE Article, which has eight clauses. Paragraph 1 basically mentions that the source state has the right to tax the profits of the PE, but only to the extent that they are attributable to the PE. So business profits attributable to the PE can be taxed by the source state. The second article provides that in order to calculate the profits of the PE, the PE has to be considered as a distinct and separate enterprise. So many of you might have uh, studied or might have some knowledge around transfer pricing. In transfer pricing, what happens is, uh, just give me a second, please. In transfer pricing, what happens is that if there is a transaction between two related parties, the way in which a taxable income or taxable deduction is calculated is that you actually calculate them assuming that the two enterprises are independent enterprise and you calculate the arm's length price. When you talk about a permanent establishment in the source state, in order to calculate the taxable profits of the PE, what is required to be done is you have to treat this permanent establishment as an independent entity. Now, let's say, for example, this PE is nothing but a branch of the foreign company. And there are transactions between the head office and the branch which are there. For calculating the business profit, the way it has to be done is that all these transactions between the PE and the head office are also required to be calculated, assuming the PE is a separate and a distinct entity, even though from a legal standpoint, a PE or a branch is a part of the head office. Third paragraph, again, is, uh, I think it, it's going to be a bit technical, but what this provides is that if while calculating the tax of the PE, the source state adjusts the amount of revenue upwards or reduces the expense deduction, in either case, increasing the taxable income of the PE, then the state of residence should actually adjust the profit of the head office that it is going to charge to tax. This is known as corresponding adjustment. And paragraph four basically just reiterates the principle that we discussed in some of the preceding slides, that if there is a specific article which deals with income and other clauses, that will override article seven. Now, all these four clauses that we've discussed are for the OECD model tax convention. When we talk about specific countries like India, the terms of the treaty might differ. There might be additional clauses. There might be certain deletions, additions, everything has to be factored into but because it's not possible to cover all of that as a part of the presentation today we've just relied on the oecd model but uh, in the course that we are going to start from july 1 what we have done is we are going to cover a specific section on how the indian treaties in each in respect of each of the clauses differ from the oecd model tax convention and outline those differences and see what are the case laws in india Now, when we look at Article 7.1, and uh, the reason I'm doing, the, doing this Article 7.1 is, unless you understand the perspective of the taxation of business profit, you will not be able to appreciate what is the PE, why is it there, and what's the relevance of that. So Article 7.1 of business profit says that the profits of an enterprise of a contracting state, so let's say the profits of FCO which is an enterprise of the state of residence shall be taxable only in that state. So the right to tax business profits of this company lies exclusively with the state of residence. 
unless however this right is compromised when the enterprise carries on business in the other contracting state so this company carries on business in the source state through a permanent establishment situated there so the business is carried on through the permanent establishment now what is important here is that the business should be carried out and the business should be carried out through this permanent establishment if the business is carried out independently then there is something which is called the force of attraction clause unless that clause is there a pe cannot be taxed in respect of those profits and situated there in there in means situated in this particular state if the enterprise carries on business as a faucet which means if the foreign company carries on business in the other contracting state through the permanent establishment the profits that are attributable to the pe in accordance with the provision of paragraph 2 may be taxed in the other state so what this means is that the profits that can be taxed in the source state will be basically the profits which are attributable to the pe so some of the key characteristics of this particular clause is that the business profits will be taxable only in the state of residence that's the rule the source state has a right to tax profit if the enterprise the foreign company carries on business in the source state through a permanent establishment so first condition carry on business where in the source state how through which a permanent establishment and how do you identify a permanent establishment you go to article 5 pe situated in source state is only relevant so what this means is if a foreign company has a pe in a third state and a pe in the source state and this pe carries on some business in the source state then the profits of this pe will not be taxed under this particular clause it may be that even this pe may have certain taxability under other article but what is relevant for article 71 is the profit derived by the pe which is situated in the source state and pe has to be determined as per the provisions of article 5 i think this we have discussed now let's come to article 5 which is a fixed place pe and this is one of the most commonly used permanent establishment in international taxation for the purposes of this convention so what these three words actually you know in law the only thing that is important is to understand how to interpret a particular clause if you know how to interpret a particular clause then basically you can see n number of cases and see what is being applied why is it being applied and things like that most of the time where people get confused is they see lot of practical examples but they do not understand the interpretation behind framing a particular law so in all our uh, courses and discussion that we do our stress is more of to understand how the law works and then all these examples become easier to grab once you are able to understand the law for the purposes of this convention the term permanent establishment means now in any definition wherever the word used is means that means that what the definition is something which is called an exhaustive definition in other words what is mentioned in that clause is the meaning of that particular term so here since the permanent establishment is qualified by the word means that means the definition given here is something which is an exhaustive definition a fixed place of business through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on so what this implies here is that suppose there is a foreign company which is there it has a subsidiary here 
the subsidiary is using, let's say, the place or a fixed place which this PE has in the source state. And it is paying rent for that particular activity. Would that become a PE of the foreign company? The answer is no, because that fixed place is being used to be let out for earning rental income. Rental income is actually taxable under Article 6. On the contrary, if the foreign company had an office in the source state and it was using this office for the purpose of carrying on business rather than just leasing it out, then that is a case where this fixed place of business may become a permanent establishment. The use of the term fixed means that there should be a distinct place which is available and this place should actually be at the disposal of the non-resident. Now, at the disposal of a non-resident, again, is a term which is widely interpreted in various case laws. There's a commentary on it. But in simple terms, disposal means that the foreign company has a right to use this place the way they want to do it. Now, the second part is it should be a place of business. So the foreign company should be carrying on business through such a place. Now, when we talk about a place of business, there is no mention in the treaty that whether this place of business should be owned by the enterprise or it can be even a rented place. There's no mention whether there should be a formal legal right to use such place or even an illegal occupancy can constitute a PE. So for tax purposes, it doesn't matter whether the place is owned rented, legally occupied, illegally occupied, in all those cases, this place would become a permanent establishment provided through which, through which implies that from this place of business, the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Just because you have a place of business, which you are using to earn certain passive income would not mean that this business place becomes a PE. As long as this place is not used for the purpose of business of the enterprise, it doesn't become a PE. Now you may be carrying out your entire business from this place. You may be carrying out a part of your business from this place. It doesn't matter. So the key characteristics of article five, paragraph one is that the definition is exhaustive. We discussed this. The foreign enterprise should have a fixed place of business. The business should be carried on from such place. The business may be carried on either wholly or partly. PE determination is an annual exercise. Now, this is important, and I would uh, prefer to spend a minute or two on this. The existence or otherwise of a permanent establishment is nothing but a fact finding exercise. And facts, as we know, can change over a period of time. Therefore, the existence of a permanent establishment has to be checked for every tax year separately. Just because in the first year you had a PE in a country does not mean that you will perpetually have one. At the same time, just because you did not have a PE in a country when you started your operations also does not mean that you may not have it in subsequent years. Yes, of course, unless there is a change in facts, if one position is satisfied in a particular year, it may not change unless there's a change in fact or law. Law changes are few and seldom. The factual changes is what one needs to watch out for. So PE determination is an annual exercise. If there is a change in law, if there's a change in facts, either of these two can result in reversing the position originally taken. Let's look at Article 5, Paragraph 2, specific places which are included in the fixed place permanent establishment. The term permanent establishment includes especially a place of management. So now, unlike Paragraph 1, where the word used was means, 
Paragraph two says that the PE includes especially the following thing. What this basically means is that if there is any other thing that meets the condition of paragraph one, that can also become a permanent establishment of the non-resident in the source state. The first one is a place of management. So if a non-resident has certain place at their disposal in the source state, which is used as a place of managing the business of the non-resident in the source state, such place can become a permanent establishment. Now, before I move on to the next clauses, one thing I want to clarify here. Any place which is mentioned in paragraph two cannot be a permanent establishment unless and until it satisfies the conditions given in paragraph one. Let me repeat, a place mentioned in paragraph two to be specifically included in PE cannot be a PE unless it meets the condition given in paragraph one, which is that it should be a fixed place of business. The business of the enterprise should be carried on through such place. The business can be carried out either wholly or partly. The second clause is branch. And what I mentioned is equally applicable in respect of all these clauses. A branch of a non-resident is always treated as a permanent establishment in the source state. See an office, a factory, a workshop, and F, a mine, or an oil or gas well, a quarry, or any other place of extraction of natural resources. So if a non-resident is working in a particular mine, where they have a particular place, that can also constitute a PE for the non-resident in the source state. Similarly, oil well, gas well, query, or other places of extraction of natural resources can also be covered. Let's look at the provisions of paragraph three, which is dealing with a building site, construction, or installation project. In this particular session, we are just trying to understand a bit more about how to interpret these provisions. I have deliberately tried to explain these examples within the section itself or within the paragraph itself, instead of framing separate examples, which we have covered as a part of our course. Now, a building site or a construction or project constitutes a PE only if it lasts for more than 12 months. So sometimes what can happen is that a non-resident may be working on a building site in the source state, or they may be working on a construction or a project in the source state. Uh, we'll come to the questions a bit later. There are some questions that I can see in the comment section. So a building site or a construction site or a project site of a non-resident can result in a PE if it is operating for more than 12 months. Now, this particular clause may be reworded or worded differently in different treaties. Because what happens is, if I just go by this particular clause, what this says is, suppose you start your work back in 2020 and the work continues all the way through 2023. And the total duration during this, which this project continues is greater than 12 months. Then the company, the foreign company would have a permanent establishment in the source state. Now this 12 month period can actually be spread between different financial years. The way this particular clause reads is, it doesn't says that this 12 month has to be the complete financial year. And generally, the normally internationally accepted principles are that the PE will arise from day one if this project of, if this period of 12 month is breached. So what all does get included in construction, installation, or project work? Construction of buildings, roads, bridges, or canals 
all can get covered under construction PE, which means that if these projects last for more than 12 months, they can result into a PE of a non-resident in the source state. The renovation of buildings, roads, bridges, or canals. But the condition in this case is that the renovation should be more than the maintenance or the redecoration of any of these items. If that be the case, even renovation of these plants can get covered as a part of construction PE. The project relating to laying of pipeline in the source state, that also can cause a, a PE. Although if the pipelines are just there, just passing through a particular country, then these can also get covered into preparatory or auxiliary activity. But the activity of construction of pipeline by itself can result into a construction PE. Excavating activities can get covered under construction and dredging can also get covered. Let's look at a few examples of installation. Installation relating to a construction project of plant and machinery maybe, or even installation of a new equipment like a complex machine in an existing building or outdoors can also constitute an installation PE of the non-resident in the source state. Now, when we look at the 12 month aspect, how do you calculate 12 months? The question which comes up is, does it apply to each individual site or project separately? The answer to that is that if the project or the site are independent and they are not interlinked and connected, then it has to apply to each individual site separately. Time previously spent on unconnected site or project. So let's say for example, if a foreign company has two projects, a and B, and both these projects are completely unconnected, then whatever time they've spent here will not be considered for the purpose of seeing the 12 month limit in project B. Building site based on several contracts or several orders. If there is a single building site, which is to be done as a part of several contracts or construction of let's say 50 or 60 apartments, which are individually ordered by the apartment owner, but done at a particular site, then the amount of time spent on the entire building site is something which will be counted. Contract splitting within two companies for less than 12 months. So this again is one of the provisions where, you know, people used to split a contract into two parts between two group companies, such that each one of them worked for a period of less than 12 months, and therefore they did not have a PE for either one of them in the source state. To deal with such provisions, there are anti-abuse provisions that are involved in various treaties, where they say that if this 12 month period is broken down between group companies, and then criteria is there in terms of group companies, et cetera, then this might be treated as the overall period might be counted. The date of commencement of site includes the time spent in the preparatory work in preparing a site. So let's say if one has to construct a building on a particular site and when they go to their place, the land is not leveled. The time spent in leveling the land will also be counted towards the time spent in construction of the building. And what if the company who is the foreign company who is working in the source state subcontracts a part of work to a subcontractor? In such a case, the time spent by the subcontractor also needs to be added to see what is the total time spent by the non-resident in the source state. Now, this example might be a little, uh, I would say not difficult, but uh, it might not, might not be relevant or too much of relevance for people who are actually working in India, because in India, partnerships are not treated as fiscally transparent, but it is nevertheless important in the international context because a lot of tax plannings are done through fiscally transparent partnerships also. So in this case, what is happening is there is a partnership in state B, which has two partners, one who is a resident of state B owning 60% and another who's a resident of a different state with 40% equity. Let's say, for example, state B, where the partnership is formed, treats a partnership as what is known as fiscally transparent. 
Fiscally transparent, what that means is that the income of a partnership is not liable to tax in the hands of the partner, but sorry, in the hands of the partnership firm, but it is liable to tax in the hands of the partner. So in this particular case, let's say, for example, the total profit which was made was $2 million. Out of this $2 million, $1.2 million will be taxable in the hands of B and 0.8 million will be the income. I would not say taxable. I would say, let's say, is the income attributable to A. In these cases, the first thing that one needs to understand is that the treaty that applies is the treaty between the residence of the partner and the state from where the income is generated. In this particular case, if B gets $1.2 million, the taxability of this $1.2 million in state C, where B is working, will depend on the provisions of the treaty between state B and state C. As against this, the taxability of 0.8 million derived by A will depend on the terms of the tax treaty between A and C. Now, if let's say, for example, the work continued for more than 12 months, and both the treaty provides that if the work is done for more than 12 months, then the profits will be liable to tax in state C, and therefore C will have the right to tax these profits. But if for any reason, let's say, the work was carried out only for 10 months, and the treaty between A and C said that unless and until 12 months are done, the profits will not be taxable in state C. In such a case, C will rule, lose their right to tax because the work has actually been done for 10 months, whereas the treaty provides for 12 months. The nutshell of this particular case study is that in case of fiscally transparent entities, the tax treaty to be applied to see the treatment is the one between the partner and the source country and not necessarily the treaty between the partnership firm and the source country. If a partner happens to be, again, a resident of the source of the country where the partnership is situated, that treaty will apply. Otherwise, the treaty of the residence of the partner will apply. We'll take this as the last part of the presentation today. And then whatever questions are there, we'll just take those because uh, otherwise we'll run out of time. Article 5.4 deals with specific activities exempted from continuing constituting a PE. So basically, when we talk about these activities, these activities are something which is known as a preparatory or auxiliary acti activities. Now, preparatory or auxiliary activities why they are excluded from the definition of the PE is that it is assumed that these activities do not effectively contribute to the productive character of a business. In other words, by doing these activities, a business is not directly earning anything. There are a lot of examples on this, which we will try and cover in our next session. But for the purpose of our discussion today, I will just briefly look at what is covered here. Notwithstanding the preceding provisions of this article. Now, what this terms means is that even if a particular place constitutes a fixed place of business, if that fixed place of business falls under any of these clauses, then the taxability will not arise. The facilities are used solely for the purpose of storage, delivery, display, or delivery of goods or merchandise belonging to the enterprise. So let's say there's a foreign company. And this probably is one of the questions which is being asked in the comment box also. So let's say there's a foreign company and uh, there is a warehouse which is there in the source state. This foreign country company stores the goods which is belonging to the foreign company. It is not storing on someone else's behalf. And this is being used for the purpose of display or delivery of the foreign enterprise. Let's assume this warehouse is run by a third company which owns this warehouse. The foreign company does not have any right or this place at its own disposal, right? And it just uses it for the purpose of this storage, display or delivery of goods. 
In such a case, this place would not become a permanent establishment of the foreign company. However, if the logistic company had provided one section of this warehouse to the foreign company, that the foreign company could have come and used it for its own purpose, it has a right of disposal over this place, then in that case, this may not constitute, this may not be eligible for the exemption given point A. The maintenance of stock of goods or merchandise belonging to the enterprise solely for the purpose of storage, display or delivery. So I guess this answer, this particular case is actually uh, more relevant to clause B. In clause A, it would have been maintaining a facility. So if this foreign company was actually maintaining a warehouse. The third is maintenance of stock of goods or merchandise belonging to the enterprise solely for the purpose of processing by another enterprise. Now, this could be a case where a foreign company uses the services of a toll manufacturer in a source state. It sends the goods here for the purpose of processing. And once these goods are processed, they are sold out to a third country without being sold to a domestic customer. When you sell it to a domestic customer, then obviously there is a business profit which is arising and you need to see what are the activities to see if there's a PE. But the, if, the, if there is only and only there for the purpose of processing, so let's say they send some raw material or semi-finished goods, the toll manufacturer actually processes them or completes them into finished goods and sends them, then that is something which would get covered as a part of this. Maintenance of fixed place of business solely for the purpose of purchasing goods or merchandise or collecting information. So again, this would be a case where a foreign company has an office in the source state which purchases goods, but the purchase should be for the enterprise, which means for this company. If the foreign company actually acts as an agent and purchases these goods for the purpose of a third party, and once it purchases this, it gets a commission, then in that case, this exemption will not be available. Similarly, if you are just into a business of collecting information, that will also get covered. Point E is the maintenance of fixed place of business solely for the purpose of carrying on for the enterprise any other activity of a preparatory or auxiliary character. Now, this clause is important and uh, like I discussed, there are several examples that can come be done on this. But due to paucity of time, we are not covering all those on this particular clause in today's session. So if you maintain a fixed place of business for carrying out preparatory or auxiliary activities, now, depending on the nature of business, the preparatory or auxiliary activity may differ. As long as the fixed place of business is used for the purpose of doing these preparatory or auxiliary activity, it will be exempt. And the last clause is nothing but a sum total of clause A to C. It says that maintaining a fixed place of business solely for any combination of activity mentioned in paragraph A to E. The last part is that provided that the overall activity is preparatory or auxiliary. In that case, this place will not constitute a PE. So I think with that, we would round up the session for today. And uh, if you want, uh, you can get the details of our international tax course in the comment section below. Uh, if I look at the question, there are two questions, one from Mayur, which is uh, already addressed. And the second question is from Meenu, considering the Supreme Court judgment on seconded employee, will it impact the PE now? Meenu, this we are going to cover in detail uh, because this is a specific question on service PE. So we are going to cover this as a part of part two of this presentation where we will be discussing service PE clause as well. Because then probably it will be easier to right now if I just start explaining this particular thing, then it might not be relevant for most of the people because we haven't discussed the service PE concept today. So we will take up this question at a later point in time. If you have any specific point relating to this, you can send me a message on a, on a case that you might be doing and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer that. So 
I guess there are no more questions which are there. So uh, with that, I would like to just end this session here. It's it's ending a bit earlier today, but I guess uh, I don't want to get into another segment and leave it half-hearted there. We will do another session where we are going to cover the remaining part of Article 5 as well as the business profit concept.